All right, everyone, and uh, welcome back. And uh, we just uh, finished up on module 11, where we got into a lot of the commonly used herbicides that we run into in lawn care. And now um, I wanted to get into the uh, insecticides that uh, we commonly use for um, preventative and curative control. So we, uh, we tend to have, as we move through this, uh, we tend to have fewer insecticides available uh, to lawn care uh, than we do uh, weed control and fungicides. So um, I will say that, you know, when it comes to, you know, especially uh, ornamental turf for like residential and commercial situations, it becomes, you know, a real problem, both for like trying to rotate chemistries and the cost and trying to be um, cost effective. So um, this is one area that honestly, I would say, you know, if, if we were lacking in, in products and technologies, this is the one that it's probably the toughest for us. Um, so typical target pests in turf grass. So before we, you know, get into the products and everything, you know, let's just start looking at some of these uh, issues that we're going to run into, you know, we'll do the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the rundown of the, the down and dirty insect pests that, that you're probably going to see up here in Northeast Ohio. Um, the the first one on the list, you know, public enemy number one would probably be the Japanese beetle, both in the landscape and uh, lawn. They can be pretty destructive uh, in both situations. If you've ever seen them skeletonize a linden tree or you've seen extensive uh, turf damage uh, from the grub activity, uh, they can be uh, pretty destructive. Um, when we find the grubs out in the lawn, usually the dead giveaway on uh, if it's a Japanese beetle grub is if you pick them up and you look at their butt, um, basically the butt, the back end of them, uh, they have these little hairs and you're not going to easily see them. You're probably going to need some sort of a hand lens to see them, but uh, you'll see these hairs on their butt. Um, they're in essence, I guess, call them their pubic hairs. And uh, on, um, <clears throat> on a, a, a grub, you're going to see around a Japanese beetle grub, for for that matter, uh, you're going to see this V-shaped uh, pattern. And so, you know, I guess one of the guys, I think Dr. Shetler at Ohio State used to tell us years ago, you know, V for victory against a Japanese, Japanese beetle. So that's one way you can, re, you know, you can actually see, um, you know, if it doesn't have that V-shaped pattern, it's probably something else. Uh, could quite possibly be a northern mass chafer. Um, so as you can see here, the uh, the northern mass chafer, um, you know, uh, tends to have a, a uh, you know more evenly distributed hair pattern on the on the raster, and much like the northern mass chafer, um, you know, the southern mass chafer uh, is also going to have a very very similar. Uh, raster pattern. Now the European chafer, as you can see, it has more, I wouldn't say it's a V, it's more of almost like a Y-shaped pattern to the uh, to the raster where you've got this really long uh, strip of hairs. Uh, this would actually be the anal slit um, if you, uh, you know, want to be gross about it. Um, and, uh, you know, when you see these adults flying around, a couple things to keep in mind. Um, Japanese beetles, typically I see these guys, the earliest I typically see them is going to be around middle of June. It's usually right around the week before 4th of July that I start seeing these first flying around. And you can continue to see adult flight um, and adult emergence uh, all the way up through, say, the middle of August, sometimes even later in the early September, depending on the year. Um, the, the mass chafers actually are a little bit earlier uh, in the uh, spring going in the summer. So I usually see these kind of peaking around Memorial Day weekend. And uh, one of the ways you can tell on the adults if it's northern versus southern is um, basically if you look, the, um, the only real difference here is your antenna on the adults. You can see um, you've got a little bit of structural difference on the antenna. Other than that, I mean, coloration, size, they're very, very similar. Um, the European chafer is going to be slightly smaller 
uh, and it's going to have a little bit more of a, a chestnut brown color, um, so a little bit smaller. Uh, again, the antenna is going to be similar to that of the northern mass chafer, uh, but they're going to be a little bit lighter brown color um, and uh, slightly smaller than a mass chafer. Um, another one that we run into, not so much on the, the, the ornamental turf side, um, but you will run into it on the uh, golf side, uh, is the black turf grass, Atinius. This one's very small. If you can see, that grub is very, very tiny, very easy to mess. Uh, that's a, di or a penny, uh, this, so that's Abe Lincoln's head in that picture, just to give you an idea of how small they are. Um, these, you know, the adult beetles tend to only be maybe, you know, a quarter of an inch in size or less. So next on the list, um, this is going to be more of a mid to late summer pest would be chinch bug. Um, chinch bug are a um, true bug. So they... If you look at the name, the bug and the chinch are separated. So anytime we have a um, a true bug, which would be, you know, in the insect world, if you are in entomology at all, I don't know if you geek out on bugs, but if you do, um, that would be order hemiptera would be your, um, you know, your bugs. So um, coleoptera would be your beetle species and the hemiptera would be the bugs. Um, so plant bugs and um, box elder bugs and things like that all kind of uh, fit into that category. Um, so these are um, chinch bug. Um, they are a true bug. And this basically illustrates the different instars that you'll see. You know, um, these don't go through a... Um, so some insects will pupate, so like your um, coleoptera, your beetle species, they actually uh, pupate. So um, you do have different instar sizes on the grubs, but then they actually um, pupate. Uh, and, um, and when they pupate, they'll form this pupil case, they'll pupate for about a six or so week period, and then they emerge as an adult beetle that looks completely different. Um, you know, from the uh, the juvenile or instar state. So very similar to like a lot of your uh, Lepidoptera species like butterflies and things like that. Chinch bug are a little different. So they hatch and then you go through these instar ages. It's almost like, an, like a human being where you start off as a baby and toddler and then you become a, you know, go through puberty and become a teenager. And, you know, as you go along this, this kind of, incline you you know become more and more adult like in your appearance until you're finally an adult um and able to um you know reproduce so uh you know chitch bug would be an example of that following that kind of a uh, um, lifeline um bill bug is another insect that we commonly run into in lawn care um, these guys typically uh, like chitch bug they'll get going in uh, when we come out of uh, winter so these would be in like um, late April, early May, typically, depending on the year they can get moving around uh, sooner. But overwintering adults come out. The overwintering adults in both chinch bug and bill bug are the ones that lay the eggs. And the eggs, when they hatch, become the problem later on. Um, bill bug, actually, uh, they're a little bit earlier in the season. Usually they get going and they're going to cause a lot of damage uh, in the first three weeks of May into early June, uh, but we don't typically see that damage until much later in the summer. By that point, the damage is already done. Um, it's too late. So similar to um, the bill bug, uh, we have another weevil. Again, these are not true bugs. They're actually weevils. Um, so weevils would actually be a member of the, uh, you know, again, like a beetle. Um, so weevils are uh, more like a beetle in that regard, and uh, you know bill bug are no different. Um, they um, they are in that weevil family, and um, and so in the same family as bill bug is going to be annual bluegrass weevil. This one is becoming a, a much bigger problem up here in northeast Ohio. Originally, kind of got started in New England and, and the Mid Atlantic. And it's, it's been spreading pretty significantly across the United States from east to west and moving further south as well. 
Um, this one, again, um, primarily targeting um, bluegrass, uh, annual bluegrass, but it can also hit Kentucky bluegrass. So it is something that we are going to have to be on the lookout for uh, in a lawn care setting. So now we move into another uh, group of insects in the, uh, in the turf care world. These would be our Lepidoptera. So Lepidoptera would be your butterfly or caterpillars. Um, and the, uh, you know, one of the common ones that we see around here in Northeast Ohio, probably the most common one that we'll run into is black cutworm. Um, next on the list would be sod webworm. Again, we will see these oftentimes in the summertime, usually toward the later part of the, of the summer. Um, but uh, sod webworm would be a, another one um, that we do very, very commonly see. Um, they they get going in the spring, um, but we don't typically see much damage associated with them because they, um, you know, the, the grass is just outpacing their damage. But when we get into the summer months, a lot of times you can tell where they're at because you'll go out and you'll see this webbing. And then when you look in those webbed areas, you'll see where the grass is basically chewed down, munched on, and, and um, you know, thinned out in those areas. And you might even see the little holes where they go burrow down into the ground. Uh, you know, they're primarily feeding at night. Uh, you don't see them typically out in the day, but if you were to go out and do a flush test uh, with some soapy water, chances are you'd, you'd have them start crawling out as that soapy water irritates them. So, um, you know, you can uh, go out and, and monitor or sample for them to see if that is what indeed you're dealing with. But um, they are, again, another another uh, insect pest that we commonly run into. Typically, these don't cause catastrophic or permanent damage to lawns. The last couple of years, though, I have seen more extensive damage from them to where I would consider it um, an economic uh, impact, you know, economic damage, economic impact, where we do want to start being more mindful of them and treating preventatively for them if we can um, another one that we um, run into up here is fall army worm. Um, they're not very common, um, but we we have had them. Um, and then uh, one that we really usually don't see too often, but we actually did have this sucker here a couple of years ago. It did some pretty extensive damage midsummer. This is true army worm. So um, the true army worm uh, can be absolutely devastating. Um, this one is a uh, primarily a southern pest, but every now and then, every so many years, uh, we can get an outbreak of this up here in Ohio. And if we end up having hot, dry summer like we did a couple of years ago, um, you know, this can be a real big problem for us. Um, and another uh, Lepidopter species that I'm seeing more and more of is uh, the cranberry girdler. So cranberry girdlers, you know, you'd think, well, that doesn't sound like a, a turf pest, but it actually uh, can be a real problem on turf. Um, and the dead giveaway with this one is it usually coincides at the time of year when we see grub damage. So it's going to be in the mid to late August, early September time frame. So if you've ever gone out and you found an area with grub damage and you get in there and you start monitoring or looking around and you can't find anything, um, you know, there's just nothing there. It's possible it could have been cranberry girdler damage. Uh, the damage is, is pretty much identical. Uh, it is identical to uh, grub damage. The grass is going to pull up just like it would with white grub. Um, but you're not going to find any evidence. Or if you're lucky, um, you may find some pupil cases left behind uh, from this where it, it basically turns them off. And the other one, too, uh, if you go out, a lot of times I've had clients of mine run into this where you go out and actually see these adult moths flying out of the lawn and flying around you as, as they're going along with their Z spray or their mower. Uh, you all of a sudden see, you know, a few of these moths flying up everywhere. Um, that's a pretty good indicator, too, because they are kind of a... Uh, characteristic. If you look, they actually do have a very kind of showy, um, you know, wing uh, compared to a lot of the other moths, which are tend to be relatively nondescript. Um, another insect that we run into, and we're seeing more and more uh, of this in Northeast Ohio, and 
we are seeing uh, more damage from this insect uh, up here in Northeast Ohio is the crane fly. So um, we deal with two varieties here in Ohio or two species. One would be the European crane fly and the other would be the marsh crane fly. Um, both of these are imported species. Um, so don't let the name fool you. Um, they both kind of came in from other places. Um, but the marsh crane fly is probably the more common of the two that we run into here in Northeast Ohio. Um, they are also called leather jackets. Um, that's a common name, especially when you're dealing with the larval stage. Um, these are a fly, so they are a diptera species or a diptera uh, versus, you know, um, lepidoptera. Um, these are diptera, uh, so they are a fly, and um, they, um, they do breathe. Uh, they have spiracles uh, through their butts. Um, basically that they do breathe through. So um, like a lot of fly larva, kind of gross in that regard, they poop and, and breathe through the same opening. Um, but um, these are a fly species. And, uh, and the reason they become a bigger problem, number one, they're annoying. I mean, if you've ever been out on a lawn in September, these things can literally be flying everywhere. They freak people out. They look like giant mosquitoes. Um, and you just get kind of inundated with them when you're out on a lawn area somewhere. Um, so they're real annoying. But the reason that they can cause damage is because they basically will sit there all winter long. These larvae will be sitting there under the soil surface all winter long, munching away at that grass. And then, you know, what ends up happening a lot of times is when we come into that March-April time frame, um, you end up coming and seeing an area like this as we're coming out of winter. And you're like, what the heck happened? That wasn't there back, uh, you know, back in the fall. Um, and, and that's exactly what happened. This ends up being indicative of leather jacket damage. So, you know, when we talk about insects, you know, how do we, how do we diagnose these issues? You know, how can we be a little smart when it comes to getting out in the field and seeing, you know, damage like this on the field? So what are some of the tools and methods that we use um, to help us diagnose insect issues. And if you think about it, you know, whenever it comes to treating any problem or curing any problem, it's going to come down to good diagnosis and using the right product. So um, how do we go about doing this? Well, you know, for starters, um, we're going to look at that visual damage. So as you pull up on a property or you come to an area, you're going to get out and you're going to visually assess the damage, Okay. Um, you're going to look at what time of year is it present. Again, you know, if you see something that looks like grub damage and the lawn's all torn up and it's March versus September, um, that's going to be a pretty good giveaway, right? Um, you know, it's it's uh, time of year is going to play an important role as to when that, that pest is active and uh, when that damage occurs. So this can be a really, really easy indicator to us before we start going down any more rabbit holes, you know, what time of year are we looking at when we're seeing this damage? Okay, um, another really good helpful tent tip, uh, you know, when we're out there and we're trying to figure out what's going on is if we can find that adult insect present. So if you go out and you see a widespread area of lawn that's, that's uh, you know, heavily damaged and dying and it's, say, mid-August and you get out there and you find a lot of these little bugs out there jumping and hopping around all over the place and they got what looks like a little x-wing on their back um you know you can pretty much be safe to assume that that's chinch bug damage you know and okay well now that i know i got chinch bug now i can go look and find an appropriate product that's going to help me get that under control we're also going to know because it's chinch bug damage it more than likely we're probably going to have to go back here once we get that problem under control and we're going to sell that customer or, or we're going to consider as a you know as a manager we're going to go in there and uh probably aerate and overseed or slit seed here in in the fall um you know likewise you know another good indicator is when you see the adult japanese beetle present uh, you know, feeding on plant material in the landscape, there's a pretty good indicator, especially if it's an irrigated property, you're probably going to want to go in there and, uh, um, you know, preventatively treat with, uh, with a uh, grub preventer in those areas. And, um, you know, another indicator, obviously, is going to be host species. So, 
You know, are we dealing with annual bluegrass weevil? Are we dealing with uh, billbug? Billbug and weevil are going to be very, very specific on their host. So if you go to a lawn and you're left with clumps of tall fescue or you're left with clumps of ryegrass all over and all the bluegrass has been killed off, um, you know, pretty good indicator that it was probably, you know, one of those two guys that went after that, most likely billbug. Also, again, time of year. When are we seeing this damage? If it's in that June, July time frame, again, probably very likely that this was billbug bug damage. And again, that damage actually was done to the plant back in um, in that, er, you know, mid to late May time frame, maybe early June, more than likely. And uh, again, this is probably something that's not going to cure itself or the grass isn't going to recover from this. You're going to have to go in here and fix it. Um, you know, another good indicator that you maybe you don't see an insect present, you don't necessarily see damage, but you have animal critter foraging going on. Another really good indicator, not always, but another really good indicator that there might be call to go in there and expect that more closely, okay? So anytime you see critter foraging in an area, you're going to want to probably go out there and, and pull up some of that grass and at least look and see. Sometimes they scored a meal there in years past and they just go back or maybe something there, they smelled something that got their attention and they just figured I'm going to go in there and look for an easy meal and they don't find anything. But um, nonetheless, good indicator there might be a problem and you may want to go in. So when you go to one of these areas that's damaged or dying, you know, first thing you're going to do is you're probably going to get down on your hands and knees and you're going to do what's called the tug test. So you're going to pull on that grass and you're going to see, does the grass stay intact? Um, does it pull up like carpet? Um, does it just fall to pieces? As soon as you grab onto it, is it just literally falling right off, uh, you know, or easily, uh, you know, coming off the, the ground as you pull up on it? You just left with a handful of grass. Um, so, you know, tug test is going to be a good indicator. You know, if the grass is still firmly planted to the soil, then more than likely, um, you know, it's not insect related. Um, you, know, you know, if it is surface insect, you know, and you see that feeding damage, it's going to be a good giveaway. But, you know, as far as the tug test goes, if it's still intact, could have been a disease, could have been something else that was spilled on that area. You know, could just be like Poetrev or something like that that went dormant. But uh, when you do that tug test, it's a pretty good, you know, first step to see because, you know, if it's a grub or cranberry girdler, it's going to pull up like carpet. Um, or, you know, if it's, um, you know, something else, you'll know. And, uh, you know, once you do, once you do do that tug test, when you pull up that sod, uh, do you see an insect present or not? And if, if if you do see a present, is it there in high enough quantities? Because, you know, if you pull up a dead area and you find a bug down there, oh, I got grubs, I got to treat. No, not necessarily, okay? Do you have a damaging threshold? Do you find six to 10 grubs or more in a given area? I've had customers tell me that they've gone out on the lawns with grubs where the lawn was literally undulating back and forth. And when you pulled it up, you might find 100 or 200 grubs or more per square foot. It was that infested with grubs. So, you know, again, um, you know, this is something where just because the insect pest is present, uh, we have to also make sure, is it there in large enough quantities to cause considerable damage, you know? So when you do that tug test, if you come back with a handful of grass, look at the bottom side, look at that stem. Um, you know, do you see a bunch of fraz, you know, sawdusty material left over where that stem's been kind of hollowed out and you see all that fraz? You know, if you see this, more than likely it was annual bluegrass weevil or more likely billbug, okay? Because this is a common indicator of billbug. The way that pest works is it's going to lay that egg on that stem, um, that that um, larva is going to burrow in and actually eat its way down through and down to the crown. And then it's going to emerge out of the bottom there at the crown at the base of the plant. And that's going to spend its, its, you know, maybe another week or two kind of hanging around the base of that plant, eating and foraging on, on the rest of the plant. You know, the roots and stuff that are around that, that uh, you know, the outside, you know, around the crown of the plant. And then it's going to pupate and turn into a an adult weevil. So um, sometimes we don't always find an insect pest right at the surface. And 
that could be the case with grub. Um, so, you know, how we know if it's grub versus, say, cranberry girdler, which causes very similar damage, you know, I might think it's cranberry girdler, but I go out there and I don't see anything. Well, dig a little deeper if you can't find any. Don't be afraid. If the lawn's already damaged. It's not going to hurt to plunge a shovel into it. You can put it right back. But, uh, you know, try digging a little bit deeper. Go down a few inches. See if you can find an insect pest um, a little bit deeper, you know. When we look at European chafer versus northern and southern chafer, one of the things that European chafer does, it allows it to become such a formidable opponent. And, and basically the reason why we've had to shift some of our timing on grub control applications is because when it pupates, or I'm sorry, when it hatches um, in early, late spring, early summer, when it lays those eggs in those age hatch, that um, grub actually burrows down much deeper into the soil where it's cooler and there's more moisture. And uh, that way it can survive through those hot, dry spells over summertime. And then once it's it's kind of grown a little bigger uh, down there deeper in the soil, and then it starts to surface back up in, say, mid-August, um, you know, it'll start coming back up to the surface to feed more at the surface. But by that time, um, you know, now you're dealing with a much bigger, more robust uh, grub that's that's more difficult to control. And so sometimes we run into a lot of performance issues because of that. So another thing that we want to look at here is, uh, you know, we can do the, the brush test on the surface. So when you come along and brush the surface of the grass, is there fraz, is there insect poop or pellets, or does the grass look uh, chewed up, you know, and just come in there, kind of comb along? Um, you know, don't be afraid when you're doing this. Don't just stand there looking down at it. Don't be afraid to get down and uh, get on your hands and knees and look close because a lot of this stuff, you are going to have to get down on your hands and knees to see if they're there or not. Otherwise, you're just not going to know. You can't just always look at something and take it for granted that that's what's going on. So get down and scout areas and um, you know, more specifically, the area that you're going to want to scout is um, if you get into an area of damage, you're actually going to want to go into this margin area um, where you have that, that border between the dead grass and the living grass. Um, more than likely, especially if it's chinch bug or another insect, you may not find it out here in this area. It's already dead. You're more likely to find it in this area. And that goes for disease as well. Usually insect or disease both. This is the area that you're going to gonna get into and scout is right here where that transition is. So, um, you know, I mentioned this earlier, the palm olive test or the dish soap test, uh, palm olive or, you know, a dish soap that's got that lemon or citrusy scent seems to irritate the crap out of them really good. Um, so you can get a bucket of water with, uh, when, you know, soapy water, pour it out on an area and, and see what comes to the surface. And, um, you know, and that, that can really help if you're lost or, or having a hard time, um, you know, you know, uh, finding something. So, so you know, okay, great. You know, we we figured out what we're dealing with. We we've identified our causal agent or our pest. You know, so now we're going to get into a little bit of of strategies that we're going to use to to get rid of them. Um, so you know, and typically when we're talking about this, you're going to be talking about insecticides. And you're going to be talking about either a, a you know, a, a soil or a subsurface insecticide. Um, you know, when we're talking specifically about white grub here, um, you know, we're, we're going to focus primarily on soil and subsurface. So probably going to be, um, you know, the most common ingredient that we see out there is probably going to be imidacloprid. Um, this would be a neonicotinoid. So if you know nicotine, uh, you know, nicotine in um, cigarettes, uh, that, uh, that uh, nicotine is, a, uh, is actually an insecticide. Um, it's toxic to us in high levels. It's very toxic to insects. So, um, you know, as you would imagine, a lot of chemistries were based on nicotine and nicotinic acids. So, you know, um, you know, one of the first ones to come along was a neonicotinoid called imidacloprid. This is also known uh, out there by the trade name of Merit. So, 
This product is a cool product. Um, it works very well uh, when used properly, and it works both preventatively uh, and it has early post control on white grubs. So, um, you know, one of the things that's happened though is, you know, our insect profiles do change over time. And one of the things that happened is just like the weeds, you remember when we talked about weeds in the herbicide section, how if you keep using the same product over and over again, you could end up selectively, um, you know, uh, ending up or, you know, controlling selectively, leaving yourself with um, problems that, that, that it doesn't control. And this is much the same thing when we're dealing with insects. So, you know, one, one of the challenges that's come up over the years, a lot of people are starting to get suspicious that we have, um, you know, resistance building um, with insects, especially grubs. And no, not yet. I haven't seen it happen yet. And the reason that we don't see resistance in insects, a lot of these insects, especially grubs, is because these are an annual insect and they only have one generation per year. Typically, when we see resistance, it's going to be areas where we see multiple generations uh, occurring in a year. So if it has the ability to continue to reproduce more than one time in a season, that's when we're going to run the risk of, of resistance. So Grubs, um, generally speaking, we're not going to see resistance develop because they only have the ability to produce one life cycle per year. Doesn't mean it's impossible, just means it's unlikely. So what is the more likely um, reason that we're starting to see breakthrough problems or performance problems? Well, it's because, again, like in my weed control analogy, I think that we've done such a good job over the last 10 or 15 years of getting rid of Japanese beetles that now we're being left with some different insects, primarily southern uh, mass chafer and European chafers. So, um, you know, these we are seeing more and more of these, which, again, you know, when we look at, um, you know, um, the uh, you know the uh, the rise in this um, it's because uh, in order to um, control these two animals we have to uh, put our grub applications out there because remember what he's talking about European and Southern chafer both do this thing where they go burrow down right so if they're going and burrowing down in the soil um, they they're 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 coming back up at a point later in the season where two things happen number one they're bigger and number two there's less of that insecticide uh residual left and so once you know if you remember with any pesticide to work we have a critical threshold if that critical threshold drops you're no longer going to maintain control insecticides are no different once that level drops below a certain point we're going to lose control okay and, uh, and the reason this is important with metaclobert is back in the day, uh, we used to put this product down in late April, early May, through May, and early June. And it was great because we would have enough of it sticking around and enough of a number that it would very easily kill Japanese beetle. Well, it's not enough active ingredient to kill off um, Southern Mass Chafer and European Chafer. So by the time uh, those eggs start hatching, later on in the season um, and by the time we start running into the European chafer later on in the season, um, it's just it's just not there in high enough levels to control them. It'll easily control Japanese beetle when you apply it in May. Uh, it won't easily control Southern and European chafer, okay? Um, the problem is too that we have to shift that timing of that grub application. So now instead of doing it in May, or early June, now we're moving it more into a July through mid-August time frame to have adequate levels of imidacloprid present in the soil in order to control those problems. You know, now we have limits though. There's limits on the amount of imidacloprid we can put down. We can only put down six tenths of a pound of active ingredient per acre per year. We have to move that timing so that we're putting that product down closer to when we would expect that Southern Mass Chafer and European Chafer to both be present 
We have to put it down at a higher dose to effectively kill those. So now we're maxing out the uh, maximum annual limit, which means we're not going to be able to split it up and do two applications, which would be great if we could. You know, if it were me, I'd do one in May and I'd do one again midsummer. But we can't do that. And that creates another problem for us, which is we used to also rely on the mayor to help us to both to suppress both bill bug and chinch bug when we were putting it on in May. Because if we could put that product on then, we would knock those critters out. We would knock those overwintering adults and we would knock those early uh, larval stages out early in the season. We would never end up seeing problems with either of those insects. So now not only uh, are we, are we, have we selectively removed Japanese beetle for the most part and we're dealing with southern mass chafer and European chafer, but now we're um, also dealing with bigger, um, we're dealing with an increase in bill bug and chinch bug on lawns because uh, we can't preventatively control them earlier in the season. So again, traditionally um, we've applied this product in May. So it's usually going to be right in this time frame um, that, uh, you know, and, and this is misleading because these should actually be pupated. So, um, you know, the, the grub pupates basically in that um, May to June time frame emerges as an adult Japanese beetle right around the 4th of July. The adult female goes back into the ground, lays the eggs, lays eggs hatch. Um, and, and these young grubs are very close to the surface. Um, so, you know, this again, this is where we were typically targeting um, the insect. However, we were applying it back here in May and then getting them in this August time frame when those eggs were hatching. This is a problem again because, you know, now that the grub populations have changed, we now have to apply um, the uh, the merit uh, product more in this June, not June, but in this July, even in the early August time frame to really have that active ingredient there in adequate levels. So, um, you know, it, it's a challenge. You know, the other reason that this is a challenge is because, um, again, we have to go at a much higher rate, okay, because the, um, the residual is only 90 days at that high rate. Um, and the other problem is that um, the maximum label rate and the annual limit are going to be the same. So point, I'm sorry, it's, I think it said 0. 0.6 earlier. Um, it's uh, 0.4 pound AI per acre per year. Um, so that's, that's going to be the maximum limit that we can get away with um, on imidacloprid, any imidacloprid product. So literally we're hitting that maximum annual limit with one application. Um, the other problem with changing that timing more to that July timeframe is that um, we, uh, we're running into more questionable weather. It's hotter, it's drier, the soil's usually dried out. So it could be a lot harder to actually get that product watered in and get it down into the soil where it needs to be. So sometimes we can even miss the boat on that uh, because that product just again, when we when we look at the target, it's just not ending up where we need it to because the weather just isn't cooperating, okay? Um, there's many, many forms of merit in imidacloprid. Um, and there's a lot of um, post pat options. So we, you know, just keep that in mind that, you know, it is a very, very versatile product and we got a lot of different ways that we can apply it. Um, you know, but again, there are concerns over resistance. Uh, this is mainly stemming from the fact that, you know, as I've mentioned through this, we've had increased failure uh, in the field with this product. Um, but, it, you know, it's not really resistance. Again, this is because our grub profile has changed, um, just like the selection of weeds and the repeated use of the same herbicide. Unfortunately, we are very limited with our choices on insecticides in lawn care, so it can be difficult to avoid using the same product over and over again. And unfortunately, as a result, we have kind of shot ourselves in the foot because we've selectively um, controlled to now give us a different grub profile in the lawn. And, uh, and that's what's really kind of leading to a lot of the problems that we're attributing to failure of the product. So 
Um, another thing that's contributing to this too is changing weather patterns. So when you look at, you know, um, you USDA hardiness zones in Northeast Ohio versus uh, 1990 versus today, um, again, as I've mentioned before, we've changed, we've warmed a little bit. So call it global warming, climate change, whatever, whatever you want to call it, we have warmed, we've actually stepped up, nothing significant, but we've moved up from say a 5B into a 6A, um, you know, situation when it comes to USDA zone hardiness. So um, a newer generation of neonicotinoid that's come out in the last decade or so is an active called clothianidin. Um, the trade name for this is ARENA. There is some um, uh, post-patent uh, available out there. Um, and this one, you know, kind of like Merit, um, it is a preventative uh, with po some post-control on white grubs. So um, pretty effective product. Uh, one of the advantages over this product is that, um, you know, we have much longer residual on clothianidin in the soil. So, you know, you know, if you wanted to get out there and effectively put something down that could buy you some additional insurance by putting it on in May and, and still having insurance that it's going to be there uh, in that July, August time frame when you're trying to go after some of these white grubs, um, you know, clothianidin is a really, really good option for that, uh, and it might also help us on the bill bog and chinch bug front, helping to suppress some of those insects, okay? So it can be applied earlier in the season than merit and still be effective. The You'd say, why can't I do this? Why don't we just do that? Why are we still using this merit product? Well, the problem is because there's no combination options on fertilizers. So one of the number one reasons that we use Merit in lawn care or imidacloprid for that matter in lawn care is you can put that on fertilizer, okay? So you can get like a 2104 lawn fertilizer with Merit. You can get it as a combination product on fertilizer. The reason you can't get uh, clothianidin or Rena or any other neonic for that you know, matter is because Back in the day, Merritt did, or uh, Bayer did this real sneaky thing. When they put that patent through, they put a technicality in there, and the EPA let it stand that uh, Bayer patented the use of neonicotinoids on fertilizers. So that means any neonicotinoid, not just one that Bayer develops and not just uh, Merritt, but any neonicotinoid. Now it's pretty shrewd on their part because it's basically blocked um, you know, uh, any other manufacturer from being able to do something, uh, and, and Arena is no exception to this. And it's really unfortunate. I mean, from an environmental standpoint, it really sucks. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people have really pressed the EPA to overrule this and even tried to get the courts uh, to overrule this, and they just won't because standing law, I mean, if they open the door with this, they could open the door potentially with any and every product that comes along for somebody to come along, make a claim, and, and, and you know, it just defeats the whole purpose of the patenting and trademarking. So, you know, again, like I said, sorry, nobody else can put a neonicotinoid on fertilizer, even if Bayer didn't patent it, and that really sucks. So um, you can use these products in a lot of, of turf managers and higher-end uh, situations or like athletic turf or other, you know, golf, uh, or other turf situations will employ these products, but just keep in mind um, they are going to be a little more expensive to use, and you're going to have to still go over that product over that turf with some sort of fertilizer if that's your intention at that time. Um, again, some uh, turf managers don't have any issue doing this, but when you're dealing with the lawn and landscape setting, it's very it's not very effective. Um, so um, along the lines of clothianidin. Um, we have another product here um, called Meridian. Uh, Meridian is, uh, the active is thiamethoxim. So this is a neonicotinoid, um, just like the other nicotinoids. So sorry, you're not going to get it put on fertilizer, but the metabolites in this case are the, uh, the real workhorse. So um, thiamethoxim, 
when it breaks down. Um, plants, animals, everybody actually have the ability to break this down pretty easily. Um, but when thiamethoxam breaks down, it actually converts into clothianidin in soil, plants, and animals. So animals, uh, you know, as you would imagine also, including insects. So um, that's one of the things that's interesting about this is it's almost like a more shelf staple form where you get it in there and then as it's being ingested, as it's breaking down, um, it's turning into clothianidin. Um, you know, so not sure if I would necessarily recommend using it. I don't know that there's any benefit to using the meridian over uh, arena um, because basically it's turning into the same thing. At the, when all is said and done, why not just use clothianidin? Um, but whatever. I mean, it's just, you know, be aware. It's another product. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, chemically, metabolically speaking, it's no different than arena. Um, as far as mode of action and what it's actually doing. Now, one of the things that I think that we need to address um, while we're in this discussion is uh, the concern about use of neonicotinoids and pollinators. So one of the things that you can imagine is that we're seeing increased scrutiny um, in the environmental uh, side ecologically over um, neonicotinoids, and that's mainly because we are seeing um, an increased um, die, uh, uh, kill off of pollinators, mainly honeybees. Um, we're seeing uh, large numbers of honeybees uh, dying off because they're finding uh, in the honey, they're actually finding residual of things like imidacloprid and other neonicotinoids and other insecticides for that matter. Uh, in the honey. So that's not good for you and I, and it's definitely not good for the bees. Um, so there is a lot of scrutiny and concern now over pollinators. Um, we're starting to see not only the EPA, but other uh, government entities starting to put restrictions in and limitations on the amount of active ingredient per acre per year. Um, we're also seeing a lot of restrictions when it comes to flowering material or anything that's in bloom. The main problem when it comes to lawn care, um, you, know, you know, when we talk about bloom and use of insecticides as a general rule of thumb, again, when we go to the agricultural side, let's look at fruit producers. A fruit producer is never, ever, ever going to spray any kind of insecticide or really anything for that matter on plants when they're in bloom. They may spray it before, they may spray it after, but they're never gonna spray it in bloom. And that's for two reasons. One, it's gonna probably cause bloom drop, all right, which is not good when you're in the fruit uh, business. And number two, it's gonna kill off your pollinators, which are uh, at the end of the day, if you don't have pollinators, you're not gonna have fruit. So um, it's kind of like a duh, okay? We don't, you know, in, a, in, a, in an agricultural setting, we're not going to be going out spraying insecticides on flowering plant material. And if you look, um, most labels on insecticides already have uh, restrictions to that, you know, uh, effect. If you remember when we talked about environmental restrictions on labeling, that would be one of them, right? Don't spray an insecticide on plant material in bloom because you're going to kill off pollinators. Well, the problem is, or the catch, is that when it comes to lawn care, um, we're spraying insecticides for entirely different reasons, and we don't necessarily care about pollinators, and nobody really cared about it except when we get to the point that we're actually causing um, bees to, to die off um, because, again, um, you, know, the, uh, you know, the pollinators are going to be out here um, feeding on this, uh, this clover, um, you know, uh, just as much as they are anything else. In fact, bees absolutely love clover. So if you're not doing a good job uh, controlling the clover out in a lawn setting and you're going to go out and, and, and spray merit on this, um, you know, you're, you're looking at problems. Now, the main problem that we see usually, um, you know, the main problem that we're seeing is primarily from the liquid form of merit or any neonicotinoid for that matter. When we're going out, we're doing spray applications and clover is in bloom uh, or any other weeds for that matter are present and blooming, um, that's where it have problems. Interestingly, research has been done to show that when you do soil applied 
um, applications of merit or other neonicotinoids and it's getting into the plant, it's not crossing the barrier into the flowers. So if you know, like in the human body, you might have heard of something called the brain blood barrier, or a lot of things when they get into your body don't have the ability to cross over into the brain. Um, the same thing happens actually in plants. Um, a lot of these products get into the plant, but they don't actually have the ability to cross into the flower. There's a barrier there, um, and merit is no different. So when we apply merit or a lot of these other chemicals as a granular uh, soil application, and it's getting into the soil and getting to the plant that way, it's not actually crossing over into uh, the, the flower. Okay, so there's no safety concern there. Where the concern is and where we are lobbying as an industry about pollinators and bees is we're trying again to use smart science to say, look, if we're going to put restrictions in place, let's put it on the spray form, not the granular form of imidacloprid or other neonicotinoids for that matter, because that therein lies the problem with any insecticide. And frankly, the irony in this is that, you know, what I find most interesting is why on earth would anybody go out and put down a merit application, but do absolutely nothing to control the grub or the, to control the clover. Okay. So why would you be going out putting uh, merit or another grub control product down? I mean, if you're not going to care about the weeds, why are you going to care about whether or not there's grubs? Okay, so um, it's just, it, it's, it's, it's ironic to me that, that this would even be a thing. But again, you know, that's where I, I try to rely on sound science. I agree this is something that needs to be addressed. However, um, you know, we need to be smart about it. Um, and again, you know, university research shows that when we apply merit or another neonicotinoid in granular form and it's taken up by the roots, it's not crossing over into the bloom. So if you are somebody that happens to be concerned about pollinators, rest assured that if you're going out doing um, granular merit applications, you're not going to hurt bees or any other pollinators for that matter. But I would, as a turf manager, I would anticipate more restrictions and bans on liquid applications of imidacloprid. Again, that's what our uh, professional environmental lobbyists, you know, for the turf care, lawn care industry, that's what we're in the process of lobbying for both at state and federal levels. Um, so just keep that in mind. So another product that we see, um, it's it hasn't really been readily or widespread used on um uh, lawns, but there is, it is available. I use this one very extensively in the ornamental side. Uh, very, very effective product for um, managing a lot of insect pests on uh, trees and shrubs and other ornamentals, um, but uh, not really used too much on the lawn care side. Um, this is an active called Dinotefuron. Um, trade names are Safari and Xylem would be the turf product. So um, Safari uh, cannot be used in lawn care, but Xylem can. So Xylem would be um, the, um, the liquid form. So again, this is a liquid application. So again, if you're concerned about pollinators, uh, we do have to sit and think about this. Um, the, the reason, why would we consider using um, a product like uh, Xylem or Dinotefuron in lawn care? Well, simply because it's highly soluble, where imidacloprid is not very soluble. Um, it is a highly soluble product, so it is it has very, very rapid uptake. Um, but, um, you know, this could be kind of a, a double-edged sword in lawn care, in my opinion, because if it's highly soluble, what happens if you were to spray this product and then get a heavy rain? Okay, um, so fast uptake, fast uh, moves into the soil quick, uh, fast uptake does have residual, but it's not going to stick around in the soil very long. Um, usually if I'm doing tree applications with Safari, for example, if we're doing a basal drench or something like that, um, you're timing that at a point that it can be actively taken up into the tree. 
Um, so we're talking about an April to October time frame, and I prefer to do it a time when the tree is going to readily take this up into it. Um, so we want to avoid conditions where it's too cool and too wet or too hot and dry. You know, we want to try and time this when we've had, you know, some rainfall, some adequate moisture, maybe in the spring when you know you've got good updraft as the tree is leafing out. It's a really good indicator that the, the tree is probably sucking water out of the ground like a straw. Same thing on conifers when they're candling. Um, conifers in general are taking up 90% of their water need in any given year when you have candling. Um, so basically, you know, same thing. That's a good time to time um, Dynatefuron applications. Turf, eh, I, I mean, it's, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure, um, you know, that, that it's something that I'm going to use as a go-to in lawn care, but it's an option. Okay, another chemistry that's come along, um, and this is, this is a cool one. Um, this is a product called a Celebrin. So um, the great thing about this is it's a novel chemistry, um, relatively new. Um, the active is chlorantranopril. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole different class, whole different family of insecticide. Um, it is, um, it is a uh, very effective, very, very safe, um, very bee-friendly, so you don't have to worry about this with pollinators. It's not a neonicotinoid at all. So we don't, you know, again, we don't have any pollinator issues. Um, it's, it's actually much more insoluble, much lower solubility than, uh, like we talked about, dinotefuron and even um, your neonicotinoids like imidacloprid. So imidacloprid and other neonics, they're kind of middle of the road when it comes to solubility. Um, the uh, the diamides like uh, acelaprin or france are even lower, very very low. Okay, very insoluble. Um, so it takes them a real long time uh, to set up in the soil. Um, but you know, again, depending on your timing, this might work out really well for you because you can really come out. We're almost talking like a late March early April uh, time frame to get this product down. Um, so, you know, in that, you know, sometimes we find this product on, and it's not a neonicotinoid, so we can put it on fertilizer. So boo, you know, bear, you couldn't touch this one because again, it's, it's a diamide, it's not a neonic. Um, so that gets us out of that. But the other cool thing about it is we can actually put it on combination with pre-emergent. So sometimes you'll see this, it's called a CAD product where we call it a combination of celeprin dimension. Um, so we can actually put this product on with a pre-emergent like dimension and put it on fertilizer. So killing more than one bird with a stone. So again, ideal timing to put this on is gonna be in April because it does take it a long time to set up in the soil. I think at least 60 days for it to get fully set up in the soil. Um, but uh, the other benefit, if we can get this on, obviously we're getting that earlier, we're getting that into the system earlier, so we stand a chance of having some suppression on bill bug, chinch bug. But the other really cool thing about a celebrin is we're actually picking up lepidopteras on the label. So that's going to be things like army worm, wet worm, cut worm, granberry girdler. And again, you know, why is this important? Um, because, you know, when we talk about... Um, you know, uh, when we talk about Lepidoptera species specifically, uh, you know, I mentioned before, cranberry girdler is becoming a really big issue. Well, your neonicotinoids are not going to do anything to touch those. They really aren't uh, beneficial for um, any Lepidoptera species at all. So you're going to miss the boat on that. And, it, you know, if we are running into more problems with cranberry girdler, you know, you might want to consider looking at, at maybe at least alternating back and forth between imidacloprid and acelaprin. But acelaprin could be a really, really good option. Um, and again, this is a very, very safe product. The LD50 for you and me, the toxicity on this is extremely low. Um, the actual product itself, the acelaprin product itself, does not require the use of a signal word. 
it 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 really is like it's repeat. If the EPA could do this, it received like the the gold the gold uh, seal, you know, the golden seal stamp of approval from the EPA. It's an extremely extremely safe, environmentally safe product. Um, again, targets a very specific thing within the insect. Doesn't affect you or I. Doesn't affect pets. You know, doesn't affect other wildlife. So it, it is a very, you know, give it the good housekeeping, a, a seal of approval. Um, it is a really, really cool product. It is pricey. Um, typically, this product on fertilizer usually runs about 7 to $10 a bag, more than, say, a Merit. Um, but you're getting away maybe, um, you know, from some of the issues that we see with Merit because, again, we're putting it on so early in the season pretty much guaranteed you're going to have it there in adequate concentration at the time that you need it when the grub and the other insects come along. Um, so, you know, when we talk about any of these products, we're going to have both granular and spray options on, on any of them. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it is going to be, again, we have it with fertilizer. So usually I see products like a 2207 there's a, a few more of them uh, coming out there. Um, and the other interesting thing about a Celeprin is that the cost, the actual uh, raw material costs, like if you're going by AI per acre of actual ingredient, chemical ingredient, um, the for whatever reason, the tech material on fertilizer is actually a lower cost per acre than buying like the granular Celeprin or the spray form of this product. So just keep that in mind. It actually is from an insecticide standpoint, it is cheaper per acre to apply this as a granular with fertilizer. Um, now, again, it is more costly than Merit. So um, I am seeing increasing industry adoption, mainly because uh, it's not because people want to spend more money. It's just because Merit has become so temperamental um, and we're seeing so many issues with it, you know, performing properly um, that uh, that to some degree people are, um, you know, just switching over to a Celeprin. Um, it has a very, very um, low rate. Um, basically, you need to be above 0.1 pound AI per acre. I typically tell guys to shoot for 0.15, so it's kind of in the middle of the rate range on it, um, but uh, very, very low rate. Um, so you're not using a lot. So again, very environmentally friendly, very safe, very low toxicity to animals uh, and humans and um, very, very low use rate. So very, very environmentally uh, friendly product. Um, and again, um, here's a picture of the label. As I said earlier, it's very safe to the point that it actually does not require the use of a signal word. So um, you will see like usually a caution um, label on the fertilizer only because the fertilizer, so that fertilizer, um, you know, by the nature of the fertilizer, it, it carries a signal word with it. But when you go by the actual active ingredient and concentrate form um, or just a straight granular form of this product it actually does not require a signal word. And again, it, it has no real off target effects or setback restrictions around sensitive ecosystems. So keep that in mind. Again, it's just, you know, because of the nature of the product, how it works, I mean, it, it just might give you peace of mind. It's going to be a safer, easier product to use. Um, so, um, I'll, you know, it'll, it, it just uh, something to keep. Uh, keep in, in consideration relative to the cost. Um, might make it a lot easier for you on a lot, other, a lot of other fronts. Now, so that was all dealing with grubs. You know, what about surface insecticides? What do we do in that situation? And when is the best time when we're talking about, you know, if we looked at like, if we could try and incorporate some integrated pest management um, principles and ideals into this, when would be the best time if we were going to go out and try and target um, surface insects, when would we do it? Well, there is a best time, and it's it's not when you would normally think. The best time to go out and, and try and control uh, surface insects, you know, keep in mind most of the damage occurs later in the summer, but the best time to prevent that 
is actually in late April, early May. It's going to be about the same time as we're going out really blanketing lawns with weed control. And the reason this is the most effective time is because we were to, if we were to go in there and throw some insecticide in with that weed control when we're total spraying, you're going to also knock out all of those overwintering adults. Okay, so all those billbug and chitch bug and, and lepidoptera and other thing, you know, your cutworms, webworms, things like that, they're all going to get moving at the same time that the weeds and the grass is waking up. So if we go out there and spray an insecticide and knock them all out, you're not probably going to have problems later on in the season, okay? And 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 this is backed in science. This is backed in research. This is not just me putting a sales pitch on, okay? Research shows that by doing this, you can significantly reduce the likelihood of flare-ups later in the season. And, you know, we don't want flare-ups. It's not environmentally friendly. The customer's not going to be happy. Now you're going to have to go out. You're going to have to put more stuff down. You're going to have to do it at higher rates. You might have to use something that's not as environmentally friendly, maybe more toxic, maybe at a higher risk to kids, to pets, other things. So, again, you know, this is what the research shows. that By doing this, we're actually being more environmentally friendly by, you know, going out and throwing an insecticide on these properties early in the season. You're also doing it at a time of year that, generally speaking, um, you're not going to see, you're not going to have, people aren't really going to be out using and enjoying their lawns a lot at that point in time. So it's relatively safe in the sense that, you know, you don't have to worry about people with reentry intervals and things like that. So when we get into the summer months from Memorial Day to Labor Day, who wants to really be, out there doing that you know people just want to be enjoying their lawn they don't have to be worrying about pesticides going down on the lawn at that time of year so you know another another added benefit to timing things earlier in the season like that so um, when it comes to surface insecticides Durasban really set the bar um, the active ingredient on that is chlorpyrifos um, this was considered by many uh, in the industry, especially the old timers in the industry, this is really considered to be the gold standard of insect control. It was cheap, it was highly effective, and it had extremely long residual. Unfortunately, just like in many of the old school chemistries, it poses many health and environmental risks, especially when it comes to that chronic toxicity. So not so much on the acute toxicity side, but um, we did see a lot of health problems and people resulting from chronic toxicity. Um, so it is still available out there, um, but it is a restricted use product. Basically, um, the only place that you can still use this is on turf uh, for golf, okay? So it's an RUP product, um, pretty much exclusively for golf, for, long, or for uh, golf courses. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, this is the one that is a standard that most manufacturers aim for. It's the one that basically most lawn care companies have been around for a while. They're euphoric anytime you talk about Durasban, um, you know, so it's just kind of funny. Uh, but it is a standard a lot of manufacturers have been aiming for for years to try and come up with that next Durasban a uh, tight product to to give us that good surface insect control. So um, many of the products for uh, contact control are are coming from a, a newer class of insecticide called the synthetic pyrethroid. Um, these are basically based on natural compounds called pyrethrins that are found in plants like chrysanthemums, lemongrass also has some in and you know any any of these compounds that kind of have some of that similar smelling um you know odor to that the pyrethroids in there um you know that's where basically we're getting these pyrethrins from and uh you know it, just like anything we're kind of mimicking these in the uh in the chemical lab um the 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 most commonly used pyrethroid or synthetic pyrethroid out there is an active ingredient called bifenthrin. Um, it is very, very widely available, very widely used, relatively safe. I mean, it can cause some moderate irritation, skin irritation. Um, if you were to breathe it in, you could have some respiratory irritation from it. Um, relatively safe as far as handling for humans, um, you know, relatively low risk there, uh, relatively low risk to pets and other wildlife, but um, 
it is very, very widely used and very widely available, um, very cheap. OK, so another reason we see it used very extensively and another reason that we could actually consider using it um, in that April time frame, April, May time frame when we're total spraying weeds. It's very inexpensive, very economical. Throw it in the tank. That's why I tell a lot of guys throw it in the tank with the weed control. You're out spraying anyways, you know, and uh, and, and and throw it in because it's going to save you a lot of headache down the road. Um so it typically in the landscape setting has about a three to six week residual. Um, spraying it is going to only give you maybe about a two to three week residual in turf. Um, the granular can buy you a little bit more time. You know, and as I just said, there is a granular formulation. So you can buy it in both liquid and granular form. Um, you know, versatility, it's also used for many other services. So things like tree and shrub, perimeter sprays, mosquito vectoring. So, you know, that's the other, the other benefit of this is that, you know, we can use it in a lot of different aspects uh, out in the field, especially if you're a profiteer and you're actually out there trying to do this as a profitable service for your clients. Um, you know, very, very versatile product. So, you know, if we're trying to limit the number of products we have on in the arsenal on the shelf, this is a really, really great product. Um, it does have decent control when applied correctly into the right target sites. So, you know, when we're looking at things like chinch bug, um, you know, it does work extremely well. The challenge is, and the reason that we see a lot of issues with things like chinch bug, is that, you know, in order for it to work properly, we need to make sure that we are at the upper end of the label rate, especially in lawn care. Um, you know, a lot of products, just like anything, we've got a low rate and high rate. Um, some products we can get away with being in the mid rate, kind of like that a celebrant. I usually recommend going in the middle. Other products like Merit or Amidacloprid, we got to be at the high end of that rate chart. Um, Bifenthrin is the same. We want to be at the upper end of that. Um, you know, like I mentioned, resistance. Um, this is an issue primarily in the south. Um, it can be combined with blanket weed control apps and other liquid apps, but we are seeing growing resistance in places like in the southeast and over in California. And why is that? Again, what do we need in place for resistance to occur? We need multiple generations. So in the south and places like Florida especially, where you have two or three generations per year, um, this is where we're starting to see resistance develop. Not so much in the north, but we are down in the south, okay? So next on the list by Bifenthrin is Carborel. This is another really commonly used chemistry in lawn care. Uh, the trade name that you probably know it by is Seven, if you've ever heard of Seven, S-E-V-I-N. Um, you know, that is Carborel. Um, really, really common. Old school chemistry, been around a long time. Um, this is a contact, so it can be used as a knockdown, similar to bifenthrin. It has about a two-week residual, um, so kind of comparable to bifenthrin as a spray. Again, it's an old-school carbamate, uh, very, very broad-spectrum control. Um, so, you know, just another tool in the arsenal that we have to use in lawn care. Um, so this is another product uh, for rents. Um, this is a relatively new product. It's uh, cyan tranoprol. So this is, um, you know, in the same diami like um, like um, a celeprin. And, um, you know, the primary target for Ferenc would be annual bluegrass weevil. It will control other insects as well. But um, basically the, the main area that we're looking at using this is for annual blue weevil control. So right now this product is limited to golf recreation and sod production for that reason. We really don't want to see resistance develop and they put a lot of money into developing these technologies so you don't want to lose it just as soon as you got it. Um, so that's part of the reason a lot of these new chemistries when they come along they end up being restricted to certain markets. Um, you know we're just trying to protect the integrity of the chemistry before it gets out there and gets too uh, widespread. Um, so again, uh, for instance, for this moment, if you happen to be in one of these avenues with sod or sports turf or golf, um, you, you might have heard of for instance, for people in the landscape world, probably never heard of it. Um, 
So, you know, those would be some of the options that we have for surface insect control. Um, and there are variations and combinations of other preventative and contact insecticides for turf. One of these would be a loft. So this is another common thing we see, again, when we're trying to go after Dursban or we're, you know, trying to go after like that all-in-one type product where we can capture a lot of different, um, you know, broad, you know, get a broad spectrum control of a myriad of different insects. Um, you know, a loft would be an example. So this would be a combination of a neonicotinoid and a pyrethroid in the form of clothianidin and bifenthrin. Um, a lactus would be another one out there. Um, a lactus is a combination between imidacloprid and bifenthrin, so another neonicotinoid. Um, the benefit of this is because Bayer holds a patent on uh, imidacloprid, they also hold the patent on this. And you can actually get this combination on fertilizer. The drawback or the disadvantage of Electus and what I don't like about it and why I don't recommend it is because you're when you put down an individual application, you're putting down two-thirds of the low-end load of uh, imidacloprid. So it's not going to really get you any benefit. And when you consider the fact when we're targeting things now like um, Southern Mass Chafer and European Chafer, where we need to go at that full point, 0 0.4 pound AI per acre threshold to get effective control of those, um, this product just isn't going to work. So, and we also need to go at the upper end when we're trying to target uh, bill bug and chinch bug suppression for the same reason. So another animals come along um, and this kind of skirts around that, uh, that, uh, that patent because we're using uh, post-patent imidacloprid, but that's uh, called imidalambda. Um, imidalambda is a combination of imidacloprid and another um, uh, insecticide called lambda cyhalothrin. Um, the trade name on lambda cyhalothrin is demand. Um, again, this is a you know pretty potent product, very short-lived, not much residual. I don't recommend lambda cyhalothrin uh, for general use in lawn care because of that. Just basically a knockdown product. But again, this is something that um, you know it can coincide because if we're looking at that July August time frame, um, this is actually going to put down a full rate of imidacloprid, a 0.4 pound AI per acre load. Of, of imidacloprid, but let, you know, because, again, because of the time frame that we're looking at, that July August time frame, when would we start seeing some surface insect flare-ups? Wouldn't it be in that time of year? So, you know, if we didn't do say bifenthrin earlier on in the season, or maybe we did, we could use a product like this. It's nominally more expensive than a merit product, but it gives us the additional benefit of putting down a surface insecticide with that preventative grub control at a time of year when, you know, that might be beneficial to us. So, um, again, it has a full load of Im imidacloprid, um, same as Merit with fertilizer. So you would put it down at the same rate, same everything. Um, in the bag, uh, Merit's typically a 0.2%. In the bag, the uh, imidalander is a 024 so the 0.2 would be the merit portion of it, and the 0.04 would be the lambda cyalthrin. Again, uh, benefit is fast knockdown, very, very fast. So if you go out on a lawn, if there's any chinch bug or bill bug there, you're going to nail it. Um, the drawback is there's zero residual on it. Um, it might help deter animal, animal foraging, but it doesn't really look like it's going to work well on that uh, on that front. But um, there was some thought maybe it would help because that lambda cyhalothrin is a bit of an irritant. So there was some thought that maybe time time wise, if you timed it right, maybe it would help deter um, critter foraging because of that. But uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend it exclusively for that. Um, Triple Crown. So this is an FMC product. Um, a newer product. Uh, this one is a combination of imidacloprid, bifenthrin, and another synthetic py pyrethroid called zeta cypermethrin. Um, so you kind of think you're probably seeing a theme here. We're not really coming up with any new active ingredients. We're just coming up with combinations of the same things over and over again. Um, this product is in a spray form. I think they are working on a granular product for 
um, use as a perimeter treatment and for uh, lawn care. Um, very, very fast knockdown, very broad range of insecticides. So this thing will knock down a lot of stuff and it knocks it down fast. I mean, this is like on the lines of, if you ever heard of a product called like Lindane or Chlorodane, um, I mean, you'd literally spray a bug and within seconds, like it would drop. Okay, so um, very, very fast knockdown, um, you know, so you're picking up that kind of rapid response on insects without um, the risk to you or I that you would expect out of something like a chlorodane or a lindane. Um, so, um, and it does, you know, it's kind of interesting. This isn't a huge, like, game changer or anything, but it is interesting that it picked up a slightly higher annual limit on imidacloprid. So 0.5 pound AI per acre versus 0.4. This is not going to be enough for you to be able to go in and spray this or put it down with, um, you know, split applications. Um, but it does give you that added benefit of being able to run it at a slightly higher um, rate uh, of imidacloprid if, if that would make you feel better. Um, and again, FMC is in the middle of working on a granular formulation. So the nice thing about any of these products is they give you the option to control both surface and subsurface insects in one application. Keep in mind um, that there's limited residual on surface insects. But, you know, if the timing works, you know, then, uh, you know, especially if you're, you know, use, utilizing that later application window with something like imidacloprid, um, you know, that's going to work pretty good for you. Okay, so now uh, on, the, on the final end of this, you know, when we get later into the season, um, this is when we're typically going to be talking about curative grub control. Um, so, you know, as you imagine, if somebody chose not to do a preventative grub control or you had breakthrough and now you have a, a grub problem, so this is going to be in that mid-August time frame, or later, this is, you know, these are the products that we're probably going to be looking at using in that time frame. So to start off, again, old standard of lawn care has always been a product called Dialox, trichlorophon, been around forever. I mean, this is an old chemistry. It's been around for decades. Um, it's very effective. Um, you have both spray or granular options. Um, the granular is going to be the most common commonly used. I'm pretty effective on curative grub. It may not look like it, but believe me, when you're dealing with, uh, say, third instar white grub or bigger, 70 to 80 percent control is really good, okay? So um, Dialox is a very effective product. The catch is it has to be watered in with uh, within 24 hours immediately if possible. So it's not going to stick around long. It doesn't have good environmental persistence. It's only going to, you know, once you activate, it's only going to stick around for maybe three or four days at best. Um, and it must be water. In fact, again, when we talk about reading the label, there are, are environmental restrictions requiring that this get watered in in 24 hours. So again, short residual, very short-lived, three to four days, um, but uh, it may require um, multiple applications in order to work because of that. Um, but again, it does um, work very effectively. Pretty much immediately kills, immediately stops feeding. Um, you're going to see an immediate response uh, on this. And the other benefit of Dialox is it's going to be one of the only products that you can use later in the season on late instar grubs. So this is going to be late in the fall or even in the following spring. Um, it is expensive. Um, typically a bag, a 30-pound bag, which will do um, 10,000 square feet at a time out of a 30-pound bag. And keep in mind, you might have to do it more than one time, depending on how bad the problem is. Um, that 30-pound bag is going to set you back around 50 bucks. Um, another product, this was in the surface insect control side of things, but another product that does have overlap into um, the grub, the curative grub market, is uh, Carbaryl or 7. Um, you know, and this will work on early and mid-stage grubs up to third instar. So we're talking really by the end of September. Once we get much past the end of September, um, we're going to need to pretty much, we have Dialox, okay? 
But up to that point, we do have a couple of options, one of which would be um, seven. Again, pretty comparable, um, 70 to 80 percent control curatively on grub. Um, and, and as you would imagine, just like Dialox, it's going to immediately stop feeding and quickly kill. Um, the other benefit to this product is unlike Dialox, this actually does have a little bit of residual. Nothing to write home about, but it is going to give you maybe up to about two weeks. So, um, you know, if you don't have ideal environmental conditions or or whatever, you know, we are going to get a little bit more residual out of this um, than we would out of um, Dialox. It also gets you away from that language with the 24-hour uh, watering um, that we have with Dialox. But um, this can be found in combination with Bifenthrin, um, you know, one product that I sell is a product called Duoside. Um, so again, you know, you can find this sometimes in combination with Bifenthrin to give you that uh, added rub and surface insect control and also give you some additional residual. Remember, Bifenthrin, when applied at the right rate as a surface granular insecticide, you can see up to six weeks of residual control out of that. Um, so this is good. This is a nice combo product if you are, you know, have multiple issues or if you're unsure what you're dealing with, you know, you're not going to go wrong with that. Also along the same lines of, of added insurance, um, you know, again, would be clothianidin or arena. Again, this is dual preventative and curative. So um, unlike Carbaryl, which is going to be a curative, um, this actually can be used as both a preventative and a curative. It must be watered into work. It's not going to do anything if it isn't. Um, and the soil should be hydrated prior to application, just like with Merit. Um, it could take up to two weeks to kill, um, which is what kind of frustrates people on this sometimes because if you go out and put this down on a lawn or something, uh, it will immediately stop the feeding. So once it gets watered in, it will immediately stop that feeding. The problem is it could take up to two weeks to kill the grubs. So a homeowner might go out and they might still see grubs. They might still see critter foraging activity. Those grubs are going to die but it may take up to two weeks for them to do so. Um, and it is good up to third instar and uh, gives you 150 day residual. So if we had some sort of a funky grub year where we have multiple egg hatches going on later into the spring or into the summer and early fall, um, you know, you do have 150 day residual of this, even as a curative treatment. Um, and again, you know, that clothianidin can be bought in combination as well as the Carbaryl uh, in combination with Bifenthrin. Uh, so just like Duocide, we have a loft granular, which will get both grub and surface insects and give you that uh, residual on both sides. So um, again, the problem with, uh, with uh, you know, a loft and uh, arena is that customers may be unhappy because the grubs may appear to still be alive and the wildlife still may forage. Um, so sometimes this can be a tough uh, sell and a tough pill to swallow because, you know, you're going to sit there and say, well, my rep said that it's working and the homeowner's looking at it and they're like shaking their head like, you know, well, <laughs> they're still there. Okay. So another one that, uh, you know, may seem counterintuitive or, you know, we may not necessarily think about is imidacloprid or Merit. Um, you know, again, just like uh, clothianidin, um, this can be used as a curative up the third instar. Normally, we think about Merit in terms of a preventative, but it can actually be used as a curative. Um, now, you do have to use it at that full rate, that 0.4 pound AI breaker. Um, and... If you already applied it as a preventative earlier in the season, no, I'm sorry, you cannot go out and apply it now as a curative. If you already put down your 0.4 pound AI in August, you're not going to come back and reapply this in September. And that, the reason I mention that is because you might think, oh, well, I put this down in August and the weather sucked and it didn't work. And can I go back and reapply it because I have some sitting around in the shop? The answer is no. Once you've done it, you've done it, okay? That's it, all right? But, you know, it does give you some residual. If you do want to use this as a curative early on in the grub season, um, you know, you do get some residual out of it. 
Um, soil, again, needs to be hydrated and for it to work properly. Not only do we have to have it watered in, but really we want that soil to already be moistened or hydrated in order for it to work properly. This is one of the reasons that I often see merit fail because again, when we shift that timing into that July, August time frame to put it on as a preventative, um, you know, the uh, you know, a lot of times we're in hot, dry conditions, the soil's dry, hydrophobic, cracked, you know, so we really want to make sure if it can be done, we want to make sure that we adequately water that soil, at least with maybe like half an inch prior to doing the application. That will ensure that it gets in and, you know, and again, you're going to water, you're going to water, apply, and then water again to get that product released and into the soil as quickly as possible. And that's going to ensure um, the best results. If you can time it with rain, that's what I tell a lot of guys, if at all possible. Um, but, you know, Merit does have the ability to sit on the surface for up to about two weeks uh, where we don't have to worry about any sort of environmental degradation. So if you applied it as a granular and it went down into the thatch and down to that soil level, it can sit there for a couple of weeks without much worry uh, before we get some rainfall. Um, it's just not going to do anything for you until that point. So some of you might be wondering, are there any organic options? There's always people that want to know if there's organic options in lawn care for any any myriad of pests and problems. And the answer is, well, yes, there are. Um, for grub, actually, we have BT or Bacillus thuringiensis. This is a, you know, it's not new technology, but there's been some newer strains of this BT that have come out that do actually appear to work quite well, possibly as well as, um, you know, imidacloprid or any number of other products as a preventative or even as a curative. Um, so, you know, this new product that's come out, Grub Gone, appears to work well. Um, we're still evaluating it. Um, it is in university trials right now to determine level of efficacy, but uh, it does look to seem to, to work reasonably well. Um, another product that we have uh, for surface and subsurface um, is, uh, is, a, is actually a toxin produced by bacteria called spinosad. So this is a you know an, an endotoxin, uh, so to speak. So again, produced by another organism, um, kind of like BT, um, but this would actually be the byproduct. So you know we're you know with the BT, you're actually putting the bacteria into the soil. Um, the spinosad is actually just kind of harvested. They they ferment the bacteria or whatever, and then collect the spinosad off of it. Um, so you might have heard of this uh, in the greenhouse side of things. It's it's sold as conserve. Um, it's also marketed uh, on the turf side as match point uh, for annual bluegrass, bluegrass weevil and other insects and in turf. Um, and it does work well on your Lepidopter species as well as a myriad of other um, insects. Another option, and I've actually sold this in the past, um, I, I think the smell is somewhat pleasant to me. It smells kind of like, um, you know, an aromatic like root beer or something like that. Um, but this is a botanical-based product called Accentria. You know, there's other options out there when we talk about botanical-based um, insecticides. But Accentria is one that I've actually used, and, and um, it does work well um, as a surface insecticide. Um, you know, general insecticide for perimeter sprays on plant material. Uh, it can even be used for mosquito vectoring. I've even used it on myself personally. Uh, it gives your skin a little bit of a zing, but um, it is, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, uh, plant oils. So relatively safe, um, you know, to, to ingest or be around. Um, but um, it doesn't have very good residual. So, you know, that's the only drawback to some of these uh, botanically-based products like Accenture is, they're just not going to work well. And there's other ones, like I got another one in my garage that um, is like a cedar oil-based uh, product. Uh, again, same concept, uh, but uh, they don't have the same residual that uh, some of the synthetics do, unfortunately. Um, now, you know, another option that you can look at on the organic side would be insecticidal soaps. Um, you know, just keep in mind, again, 
um, that these products don't necessarily have um, the same residual as synthetics. So um, timing is going to be more critical for, for when you're going to want to go out and target a pest. And also keep in mind that you may have to do more frequent follow-up applications if you choose to use something like, um, you know, any of these. Uh, you know, the BT, um, that is going to have some residual. I believe the Spinosad's got some better residual in it, but just keep that in mind with any of these that you are going to have to apply them more frequently uh, than you would the synthetic um, so the other option when it comes to organic that may not necessarily come to the front of your mind is you could actually recommend planting turf grass cultivars that have endophyte and are resistant to the damage. So some, some grasses, just by how tough they are in nature, um, you know, things like tall fescues and HGT, Kentucky bluegrass, they're really, really tough, aggressive grasses, and they actually... Um, they don't necessarily ward off, but they can just um, they they can just uh, you know outgrow any kind of insect pressure or damage, or just really rough, tough, rugged grasses that are just strong and can resist that onslaught. But um, you know, tall fescues and some other turf grasses as well also have endophyte. Um, tall fescues are going to have the the highest level of naturally occurring endophyte. And again, those endophytes, it's a symbiotic relationship between the grass and the fungus. It actually lives inside the turf grass. Um, and, uh, and, tur and tall fescue's got the highest level of naturally occurring endophytes. So tall fescues generally don't have too many insect issues because of that endophyte. It kills them off. So, you know, um, that's one nice benefit. Um, it's not going to be foolproof uh, just because you plant tall fescue doesn't mean that you can't get some insect issues. But generally speaking, um, the tall fescues in and of themselves do a pretty good job of warding them off uh, unless it's a heavy year. So um, that concludes our discussion on um, turf grass insecticides. And again, like I end every one of them, uh, if you have any other additional questions, if you feel like I could have elaborated on something a little bit more, you want to go into something a little bit more in depth please feel free to reach out to me and uh you know hit me with your questions that's what i'm here for and uh we will wrap it up here and uh thanks for listening guys and hopefully you found this helpful